I'm going to ask you, if you will, to open up your Bibles and follow along with me this morning, as we often do. Open up your Bibles over to Genesis chapter 12. In Genesis chapter 12, that's where we're going to be looking here in just a moment. But before we do, I want to take this opportunity to welcome each and everyone here with us this morning. We're excited that we're able to be here. We recognize that it's a new year, and, and oftentimes when we look and we see that it's a new year, we're kind of happy about it. I told Brittany last night, I don't understand why sometimes for myself it's just another year. It's another day. What's the big deal? Brittany reminded me, well, it means you turn older. I said thanks. But you see, when new years come, something else comes too. And that's resolutions, isn't it? Each time that the new year comes around, people have this tendency, they have this habit of saying, I'm going to make this resolution in my life this year. We do it as Christians too. And sometimes that resolution, actually oftentimes that resolution we'll make is, I'm going to read the Bible through this year. Or I'm going to be at church more often. I'm going to make sure I'm there when the doors are open. See, we make them. The sad part is, is that resolutions still fail. Even for us as Christians, when we set out to make a resolution and say, I'm going to read my Bible through this year. I've said that before. Guess what? I, I wasn't able to do it. Not because I didn't want to open up my Bible and read it, but for whatever reason, I failed. See, the reality of it is that when we look at resolutions, no matter if it's one where we, we look and we say, I'm going to do this spiritually, or if we say, I'm going to lose weight, or I'm going to eat better, or I'm going to save money, whatever it might be, only 16% of them succeed. Only about 16% of them actually do make it through the year. Realize that's over three-fourths, over 75% fail. This morning, I want to look at the reasons why they failed. Because when we look at resolutions, there are people who have actually spent time to say, why is it that they didn't succeed? Why is it that these resolutions did not happen? And the first one was, they were unrealistic. They're unrealistic either in the, the sense that they were excessively easy to succeed. And so when trying to complete them, people got bored with them and just stopped. Or they were so hard and so difficult that it was not possible for them to succeed in them. And so there's the first reason. The second is they don't have accountability to them. Now look at something that happened to me a few years back. Me and my dad both decided we were going to lose some weight. We did. We both lost some weight. We both felt better. Something happened. I wasn't able to, to go through my normal routine. Accountability between me and my dad fell away. Me and my dad both put on that weight again. That's what happened. Because we didn't have the accountability. Or because there wasn't any tracking to it. There wasn't any review of the progress that's been made. If you want to do something, you want to succeed, what do we have to do? We have to look back and say, how did I do this week? How did I do today? If you don't do that, you won't succeed. Or sometimes they didn't succeed because people looked at it and maybe it wasn't so excessively hard that it was impossible, but they looked at themselves and they said, I just can't do this. I don't have the strength. I don't have the willpower. I don't have the ability to actually complete this resolution. To actually hold firm. Or maybe they look at the resolution and what they actually see is that, did they really even make one? They make it so vague and so, so open to interpretation that they don't even know if they succeeded in it or not. It's unclear. And it's unclear, and even to the point that, that maybe they weren't even able to make a plan for it. Or maybe it was a clear resolution, and yet they didn't make a plan. They didn't make a way for them to succeed. You know, we talk about resolutions that we might make as Christians. 
But you know what's really interesting to me? God's children are all called to a resolution. All of us. Each one who, who says that they are a child of God, he expects something of them. I ask you to turn over to Genesis. So when we look in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, he's speaking to Abram here. And as the Lord speaks, it says, beginning in verse 1, it says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. Right there, starting off, we see that the Lord called Abram to do something. To make a firm decision and a choice and a decision that he was going to make in his life. Let's continue reading. Verse 2, he says, I will, make a great, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curses you. And in all the families of the earth, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Verse 4. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram decided, I'm going to make a firm decision, a firm choice to do what God told me to do. Guess what? That's a resolution. That's what it means. But, you know, we don't only see it when we go back into the Old Testament and we see where God specifically spoke to them. We also see it if we look over in Acts chapter 26. We're not going to read all of Paul's account, all of him reaccounting the the conversion in which he had. But let's read here and just part of it. It says, but rise. Remember, this was the Lord speaking to Paul or Saul at the time. And he told him this. He said, but rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose. He says, here's the reason that I'm before you. Here's the reason that I came to you. He said, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and the things which I will yet reveal to you. I think, well, he didn't tell him to, to do something specific, but he did. He says, you are now going to be a minister and a witness. He says, I'm telling you, this is what your resolution is. This is the choice that you need to make in your life, Paul, to go and to teach the Gentiles. That's what he ultimately ends up telling. Him. God required him to make a decision. We are required in our life to make a decision. We are required to make a resolution. And you know, a lot of times what ends up happening, instead of looking at the, the decision that we make in our life, instead of looking at it and saying, I'm going to hold fast to this decision, we end up looking and saying, okay, I'm going to hold fast to it, sort of. But all these other little things that happen in my life, all these other little excuses that I might be able to use, we use. And we end up saying, well, that was just too difficult for me to do. I didn't have the time for me to do it. Look at our attendance. We go and we make a resolution, a decision that we are going to be faithful servants of God. And yet, how often might we say, I'm just a little bit too tired to make it to church today. I care a little bit too much about going and doing this other thing with somebody else. I care too much about making sure that, that I go to my secular jobs, that I don't tell them I won't be there Wednesday nights. No, we make excuses, don't we? This morning... Let's look at our resolution. But let's look at all these reasons that it actually might fail. And let's see if there's actually any reason for this resolution, for this decision that we make to serve God and to worship Him. Let's see if there's a reason for that to fail. The first one that we brought up is that it wasn't really a realistic expectation. Is it realistic for us to expect ourselves to worship God, to serve God, and to live a godly life. Well, was it a realistic expectation for God to tell Abram to leave his family so that he might go to a land that God will show him? 
It was. Was it a realistic expectation for Christ to tell Saul that this is what you're going to do? You're going to be a minister. It was. Why? We know it was because we see what they did. We see that they obeyed what was told of them. They did what was told of them. We too have this same type of thing. And sometimes in our life, we look at this resolution and we think that it's really, really difficult. Guess what? It can be. It can be hard for us to live the life of a Christian. The scripture reading this morning was taken from the book of Colossians. The book of Colossians in chapter 3. As you read here, we're going to read verses 5 through 7. But I want us to, to focus on what it's saying. Hold on. Beginning in verse 5. It says, Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in in them. He tells them to put away your members. These were things that weren't just they weren't just things that they did. These were things that they were. Would it be difficult for us to lose an arm and figure out how to continue in our life? Yeah, I would. It would be hard for us to figure out how am I going to get, to get dressed in the morning, something simple that we might take for granted. That's what he's telling. He's telling them you have to put aside all of these things that you were. This is not an easy resolution by any stretch of imagination. But just because it's not easy doesn't mean it's not possible. Doesn't mean it's not something that we can't do. You know why we know that this law that this gospel that we've been given is something that we can do? When we read over in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 7, we've been going over this in our Wednesday night Bible class. But it brings up there in verse 6, beginning in verse 6, it says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Paul was amazed that they turned away from this gospel. What did they turn to? They turned to the law, the old law. What amazed Paul is that they turned away from something that was possible for them to do, that it is possible for them to keep the law of Christ, and they turned to something that was impossible for them to do. We aren't expected to keep the law of Moses, are we? It's not possible for us to fully keep the law of Moses. It's possible for us to keep the law of Christ, though. Paul told Timothy, when we look in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul ended up telling Timothy, yeah, it's going to be hard. But let's read here. 2 Timothy chapter 4, we're going to read verses 1 through 5. I'm not going to stop at verse 4. Verses 1 through 5. It says, I charge you therefore before God and Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Conv convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn away their ears away from the truth and turn aside to fables. We're going to read verse 5 in just a second. You know what Paul's telling him? It's not always going to be easy for you to teach them. Because they're not always going to want to listen to you teaching them. To the extent that they're going to raise up for themselves, find themselves teachers who will teach what they want to hear. Sounds similar to today. But you know what he goes on and tells him in verse 5? He goes on and tells him, But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Yeah, he tells him it's going to be hard. We see that. 
But he doesn't tell him, it's so hard, just stop. It's so hard, you know what, just give up, who cares? He tells him, no, keep going. Because it's possible. Many today will tell us that living the way that the scripture tells us, that the Bible tells us, is not physically possible. They will tell us that we can't keep what it tells us to do. Because we're only human. We can. And we can work each and every day that maybe we do slip. To make ourselves better. To do more for Christ. And to live in His will better each day. It's possible. But not only is it possible for us to do it, when we look at our lives, we can, we can know for sure, we can know for certain that we are going to be held accountable to this resolution. This isn't one that we can do and say, well, no one's really going to be there to make sure that I did it. Because guess what? God will make sure that we did it. When we talk about being held accountable, there is no better source of accountability than our Father. Let's read over here in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Paul tells Timothy again, he says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. A worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Does he tell him to present yourself approved to one another? That me, Jason White, now I have to be held accountable to this other person? No, he says he's accountable to God. What better accountability do we actually have? Than the one who knows and sees and knows every single thing that we do in our life. There isn't. There isn't anyone better. God's children have always been held accountable. We talked about this in our Bible class this morning. In Amos chapter 7, verses 7 through 9, where we see the, the vision of the plumb line, right? Talked about that for a little while. God brings in his standard and measures his people against it. He held them accountable. Always has always will but while we might not be held accountable we might not be we might not have to answer to one another that doesn't mean that we don't have something given to us with one another we are able to hold one another accountable not in the sense that they answer to me in the sense that i punish them or discipline even though that is part of it too but in the sense that that we are to make sure that one another are upholding the will of God. We are to make sure that we are doing what's right. In Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 21, we're not going to turn over there this morning, but what we see here, what we see here is the account of Paul rebuking Peter. Why did he rebuke him? He rebuked him because Peter was, was being a hypocrite. Paul held him accountable for what he did. Not holding him accountable according to Paul's standard. Not holding him accountable according to what Paul thinks was right. But according to what God had revealed to Peter. He held him accountable. We are required to hold one another accountable. Not to us. To God's law. Even Christ goes on and mentions in, in Matthew chapter 18 that when we have brethren, brethren who offend us, what do we do? We don't ignore it, act like nothing happened. No, we go to our brethren, don't we? If I go to my brother who has offended me, if I go to a brother who has sinned against me, what am I doing? I'm holding them accountable for their action, right? When we look at being able to be here this morning, what we have is opportunity. We have opportunity to make sure that we hold one another accountable. 
and asking them how their week went, and asking them how have we served God this week. Being here offers so many things. But something else that we do while we're here, we, we examine ourselves, don't we? See, as Christians, we have this, this wonderful thing that, that we do. We can examine ourselves. I don't think that there would be anybody. I know the scripture makes it very clear. That examining ourselves is something we can do. And not only is it something we can do, it's something that's expected of us to do. We're told over in 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, it says it very clearly and very plainly. He says, examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. Verse 6, it says, but I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. He tells them to examine yourself. When we talk about what are they examining, it's not making sure they don't have any moles or new moles. It's making sure that they have walked in the faith. That's the choice that we make, isn't it? That's what Paul tells them here that they are to do. Examine their progress in life. Have I walked in the faith? Maybe, maybe I'm going through a time where I have to make things better. Maybe my walking in the faith wasn't very good last week. Did I examine myself this week and say I walked better in the faith this week than I did last? That's part of the review. That's part of checking our progress. We're even told that we look at ourselves and we examine ourselves before we go to a brother. Over in Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. In Galatians 6, verses 1 through 5, the context here is speaking about going to a brother who is erring. When we have a brother who is erring, we're told to go to him. But what does it tell us there, beginning in verse 1? It says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in, spirit, in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another, for each one shall bear his own load. Before we even go to our brother, we are to look at ourselves. Why? Make sure that we aren't the one who is tempted. Look at ourselves and realize that we do fall into these same things sometimes. And to address our brother in the way that we would want to be addressed. We have a great resolution given to us. And we have one that when we sit down and we measure ourselves, we don't have to sit there and wonder... And ask ourselves and say, well, what am I really measuring it against? Where do I really find this measurement? Where, where do I really find this standard? No, it's, it's simpler than that. John chapter 14, verse 23. Jesus answered and said to them, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent. We examine ourselves not against what we think, but against what we're told. Against the standard that we have in the scripture that is plain and clear for us to understand. That's what we have. But then maybe we look at ourselves and, and we say, you know what, the the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Have you ever told ourselves that? I've told myself that. Man, I want to do good, but man, my flesh is real weak. I guess I just can't do it. And so we look, we try to find that excuse. But you know what ends up happening? What ends up happening is that we think that it's in ourself to do these things. We think that it's in my own ability 
to do these things and we forget. We forget that as we're told in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, where Paul, once again, writing to Timothy, says, For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know that whom I have believed and pers- whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. It doesn't rest in me, does it? It doesn't rest in what is my ability and what am I capable of doing. It rests in what is God capable of doing. What is he capable of doing? What is his ability? Because I promise you this, his doesn't end. What he's capable of doing doesn't end. It doesn't go away. And I can never say it's not in me. Because if I'm trusting in him, then it's in him. So do I have that type of courage? Do I have that type of courage in my life to look and say, it's not about me. It's about trusting God. It's about what we're told in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. To do not lean on your own understandings, but what? But in all your ways, acknowledge Him. Trust in the Lord, because in His ways, I can succeed. Trust in the Lord, because when I look at it, and I recognize that it's not in me, I recognize something else too. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 6, it says, So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? You know, sometimes we think about what can man do to me, and we talk about it, well, what can this man or that man, well, what can I do to me? If I sit there and don't have the courage to put my, my resolution into the hands of God, then what am I doing to me? And what I'm doing is I'm looking physically. I'm not looking at it spiritually. I'm not looking at it the way that I ought. I'm looking at it to fulfill my own will. Instead of having the courage to know that God's will will succeed. I just have to have the courage to put it in His hand. Romans chapter 4, verses 20 through 21, where it says, speaking about Abraham, it says, He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised he was also able to perform. Abraham looked at these things that God told him to do, and he trusted him. He had the courage to say, God's will will succeed. If he told me that this is what's going to happen, then that's what's going to happen. If God tells me that there is a way for me to escape temptation, and yet I choose to not find it, that's not because God's ability didn't make it available. It's because I didn't look for it. And our goal is very clear. We're not walking this life aimlessly wandering around. We know what we're running towards. We know that what we are searching after is eternal life. is bringing glory unto God. And being with Him in glory. 1 John chapter 2, verse 17 tells us whoever does the will of God abides forever. In John chapter 10, verses 28 through 30, he tells them that he will give them eternal life, speaking about those who love him. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and verse 17. Let's read there this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and verse 17. It says, For our light affliction, which is but for, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Yeah, it's hard. But it works for something better, and we're working for something better. We're living for something better. And lucky for us, we don't have to look at this goal and sit there and wonder and ask ourselves, how do I get there? 
how do I make it to this goal? Because the plan's actually pretty clear. It's pretty straightforward about what we have to do. What we do is we change our heart. We change where we're setting our sight. Are we setting it on the things of this earth? On the things that we want here? Or are we setting it on something better? Continuing there in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, he says, While we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary. The things which are not seen are eternal. How do we gain that eternal weight of glory? By setting our sight on the things not seen. By following in the steps of Abraham, who we can say is our father. We follow in those lights. We look at the life that we're living now. And we look at the plan that we have, what we're told in Galatians chapter 6, verse 8. Where it says, for he who sows to his flesh will also, will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. We set our mind on the things not seen. We set our, our will not on sowing for the flesh, but sowing for the spirit. That's how we succeed. And we do that by opening up our Bible, by studying it, by learning, by knowing what we have and what it tells us to do, by knowing all of these things. This morning really comes down to, to two questions. I said that as Christians, we make one resolution, one resolution that we have to keep. And it's not a re resolution that we can keep for a week or a month or a year or a decade. It's one that we have to keep for a lifetime. Have we made that resolution today? Have we made the choice that we are going to be added to the body of Christ and that we are going to be raised to walk a new life? And have we chosen to actually walk that new life? Because we can, we can be baptized, and guess what? We can still fall away. So where do we stand this morning? If we took the time to examine ourselves like we should, where do we stand? Where are we actually at in our faith? The lesson is yours this morning. If you need to come forward, if you need to come forward and be added to the body of Christ, to make that choice in recognition that the only way to salvation is through Him, We've already done that and we've walked away. We've fallen away from the truth. And we need to make things right in a public manner. Or we need prayers from our brethren. From those who are here. From those who can help. If we need each other to hold, hold us accountable a little bit more. Whatever the case may be this morning. We ask and we plead with you. Come forward as we stand and as we sing.